Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security Disability exams. And today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I think is extremely important, both for people applying for Social Security and for doctors doing Social Security Disability exams. And that's Social Security's listing of impairments. As usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study, and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now, before I get into the listings, I need to explain that there are two basic ways to qualify for Social Security disability. One is to have one condition that is severe. For example, if you are completely blind, which means a visual acuity of 2200 or worse, Social Security considers you disabled. Likewise, if you're completely deaf, if you cannot hear and understand speech, even if the other person is yelling, Social Security considers you dis completely disabled. A minority of people meet these qualifications. More people who Social Security deems disabled have two or one or more conditions, neither of which alone would meet Social Security's disability criteria. Now, Social Security's listing of impairments, which I have linked to below, in the description of this video. It's available for free online. Goes through almost every possible illness and injury and describes the criteria necessary for Social Security to consider someone disabled if they only have one illness or injury. Throughout the listing of impairments, you'll encounter the word severe. And what that means is whatever you've got, it, Social Security says it has to be severe for you to qualify for disability. Again, that's if you have one condition only. It must be severe and it must meet Social Security's description of severe. For example, a person might be hard of hearing, have back problems and arthritis in both knees, but neither of the three being severe. However, added together, Social Security may consider that person disabled. Now in the listings, there are 14 categories for adults. These include musculoskeletal, problems with the bones, joints, and muscles. Special senses and speech, this includes sight, hearing, and the ability to speak. Respiratory, that's diseases of the lungs and breathing. Cardiovascular, diseases of the heart and blood vessels. Gastrointestinal, diseases of the stomach, intestines, liver, and digestive system. Genitourinary, the urinary and sexual organs of males or females. Hematological, this is diseases of the blood, spleen, and bone marrow, which produces the blood. Skin, yes, you can qualify for Social Security with some con skin conditions. Again, they have to be severe. Endocrine is diseases of the glands. Congenital disorders affecting multiple body systems. Congenital means something that the person is born with. This would include such conditions as Down syndrome, where there is mental retardation and often heart and other system problems. Neurological diseases of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Mental disorders conditions such as anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar illness, and the personality disorders, cancer, which is obvious, and diseases of the immune system. This includes conditions such as AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. There is also a separate listing 
for children. And this has the same categories as adults, but with one extra, which is very low birth weight, children who are born very small, usually because they're very premature, and failure to thrive. That's babies who don't grow and gain weight well, or even lose weight. Now, the most common problem that patient, patients claim in disability claims is problems with the spine, and especially problems with the neck and low back. So I thought I would go through the listings and give you an example of how to evaluate this condition. And if you are a patient with the condition, what Social Security is looking for and requires you to have if you are to be declared disabled based on your spinal problem alone. With compression of the nerve roots. This is the most common type of spinal problem we see in Social Security disability claims, what's commonly known as low back pain with sciatica. What this means is the nerves that go to your legs come out of your low back and they run all the way down to your toes, giving you the feeling and strength in your legs. These nerves can be pinched or compressed in the spine due to various spinal problems. And when that happens, you'll have problems with your legs. Now, for the physicians in the audience, the listing of impairments is very extensive, and I don't suggest you read the whole thing. But I do suggest you read the common conditions that patients present with. This will help make your reports better because you'll learn what Social Security focuses on, and then you'll be able to indicate in your reports whether the patient has or does not have the characteristics Social Security is interested in. For patients, you will also learn what Social Security wants to know if you have that's related to your problem. It's a little bit different it's a little bit difficult, I meant, for patients because the listing of impairments is written for medical professionals. You might need to do some research, or if you have a friend who's a nurse, you might be able to enlist them to help you to understand the listings. So first, you go to Social Security's listing of impairments and you'll see that the number one category, category 1.00, is disorders of the musculoskeletal system. So you go to that system and then you find at section 1.15, disorders of the spine. Please note, Social Security does not award disability based on low back pain alone, no matter how severe that pain is. There also has to be problems with the nerves coming out of the low back. Some people may feel this is unfair. I'm just giving you the facts. Please don't shoot the messenger. So in section 1.15, we see that first, the patient must have symptoms of radiculopathy. That means pain in the low back going down one or both legs and or paresthesias, which is funny feelings like hitting your funny bone going down both legs or one leg. This could be tingling, pins and needles sensation, electric shock type sensation and or muscle fatigue, which means weakness in the muscles of one or both legs. And there must be corresponding neurological signs present. These signs can be present on the physical exam or on tests, which would be a nerve conduction test a test that tests the nerves coming out of the back and running down the legs to see if they are impaired or damaged or not. On exam, the doctor would be looking for numbness in the leg, weakness in the leg, 
and abnormal reflexes in the leg or both legs. And also there must be corresponding findings on imaging. That means that on x-ray, CT scan, or MRI, there must be abnormalities corresponding to the patient's symptoms and findings on exam. And the person must need to use a walker, two canes, two crutches, a wheelchair, or a rollator. Note that one cane doesn't qualify you unless you need to use an assistive device for one hand, such as a cane, and you have problems with the other arm or hand that make it impossible for you to do your work. So for physicians evaluating patients with low back pain, you want to check the back for tenderness, deformity, and muscle spasm. You want to check the patient for problems with straight leg raising in the seated and supine position. You want to check the sensation in the legs looking for abnormal sensation. You want to check the strength in the legs looking for motor weakness. And you want to check the reflexes looking for abnormal knee or ankle reflexes. It's very important to put in your report whether the patient has any of these abnormalities or does not have them. If the patient has symptoms and physical signs of back pain with nerve problems, my diagnosis will be low back pain with evidence of right or left or bilateral nerve root compression. If the patient only has symptoms but no signs on physical exam, my diagnosis will be low back pain with symptoms but no signs of nerve root compression. And if the patient has no symptoms or signs of nerve root compression, my diagnosis will be low back pain without evidence of nerve root compression. Now, what if a patient has multiple problems none of which are severe enough to meet a listing. Well, they may still qualify for Social Security disability. It depends on how many problems there are and how severe they are. Social Security adds them all up and comes to a determination whether the person is disabled or not. How they come to that determination is a very closely guarded secret because Social Security doesn't want people gaming the system in the same way that the Internal Revenue Service doesn't publish their criteria for auditing people's tax returns. However, if you are a patient, you can make a good guess as to whether your disability application will be approved by looking up the listings for whatever conditions you've got and seeing how close they come to meeting a listing. For example, if you have two conditions and neither of them has many of the features Social Security requires for meeting a listing, it's unlikely that your application will be approved. However, suppose you have three conditions and each one of them is close to meeting a listing, but not quite. In that case, it's likely that your application will be approved. I can't guarantee any of this, but that's my best understanding of Social Security's evaluation process. The only thing that I really can guarantee is that if you need a listing, Social Security will approve your disability application. I'll give you a couple of examples of patients I've seen. Under special senses and speech, if speech is a severely impaired, the person meets a listing. Well, I've seen two patients who've had terrible strokes who completely lost the ability to speak. They couldn't even say their name or yes or no. Both of them met a listing. I've had many more stroke patients who had some difficulty with speech ranging from mild to fairly bad. However, they did not meet a li listing based on their impaired speech alone. However, the other problems that 
were caused by their stroke added together may have caused them to need a listing. Likewise, under musculoskeletal, if a person has severe loss of use of both arms or both legs or one arm and one leg, they need a listing. Again, it has to be severe. Well, recently I saw a patient who'd had neck problems and the nerves that went from her neck to her hands had been severely injured and she'd had surgery, but it was too late and the nerve function didn't come back. And this person had severe impairment of the use of both hands. That person met a listing. Likewise, my, one of my most extreme cases, I had a patient who was born with no legs at all, nothing. Well, I'd consider that pretty severe impairment of the use of both legs when you don't even have them. That person met a listing. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and as usual, remember, if it happens, it's possible.